Well, welcome. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Drummer Show. As you know, I'm your host, Sharon Moore. Would you help me welcome to the Extraordinary Drummer Show, David Black. Hey, David. Oh, thank you so much. Good to be here. Great <laughs> to be here. Oh, we're glad you're here. I want to start as just, just where I was there. I said, accomplished and complete. We're going to get to your awesome credits and your awards and background and so forth, but clear us up on that. Show us, as give the drummer community, what does that mean, being accomplished and complete? He has the awards, he has the music down, he has everything is packaged and it covers a large scope of everything. In other words, with this long setup here, the word show business says show business, and you have accomplished both of those, my friend. Oh, that, that, you, you're so kind, and I'm so honored to be here and to, um, you know, to share my experiences. I, I think for me, well-rounded was a term or a word that was drilled into me from every music teacher I ever had because it, it meant um, not only success, but it meant being able to continue to work in the industry if you just focus on drums, if you just focus on composition, if you just focus on teaching, uh, you, you may be limited in the scope of, of what you can do. And, you know, you may have some success in that, but it might not be enough to make a living full time. So I was all, always encouraged to try and do as much as possible and learn as much and a variety uh, of areas in the music business or whatever, not only to make a good living, but to be well-rounded and, and to stay gainfully employed, um, you know, for an entire career. How did you balance all of it? And then how did you not get one-sided and get locked into one thing? Um, well, it, it, it's funny because, you know, a lot of it, ebbed and flowed. I think, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I think Louis Belson was a big influence in that. My goal was strictly to be um, a drummer. And then uh, I met him and he stayed at our house uh, when I was in high school and played with our high school band. And I knew that he was a writer and had written books and, and done all those kinds of things. And I just was impressed by the fact that he was able to do all that and he was well-rounded and, and stuff. And so I think I learned a lot from him, the importance of being well-rounded, that being a composer helped you as a drummer, being an author helped you with being a teacher. Um, and so um, I was interested in all those things and I just think it was um, something that I wanted to do and something that I really felt would make me a more well-rounded person. And, and certainly uh, it would enable me to get to keep working because I could do a lot of different things and um, pull together uh, money from a variety of sources. David, let's go all the way back. Okay. Let's go all the way back. You're from Bowie, Maryland, is that right? We Bowie, Maryland, yes. Bowie, Maryland, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, what was the scene back in Bowie, Maryland, and how did you get, and when did you get your first drum kit? Well, Bowie, Maryland um, is kind, it, it's um, kind of a suburb of the Washington, D.C. area. We happen to be in Prince George's County, which is one of the best music counties, I think, in the whole country, but certainly on the East Coast. And was very fortunate to have tremendously gifted um, junior high and high school band directors and a jazz band director who also um, uh, was a, a jazz publisher, creative jazz composers by the name of Joe Carley. And so he published Clark Terry's music and Louis Belson and Irby Green and Mundell Lowe and a whole host of those artists who he would then get to um, come perform with this high school junior high uh, jazz band at uh, these events called the Swing Ins, and they were the last end of the year powwow kind of thing. So, you know, I was exposed to a lot of those kind of um, opportunities. And the last year that that band was in existence was the year that Louis Belson happened to be um, 
you know, the guest artist at that, uh, at that performance. And he decided he wanted to, um, you know, stay at our house rather than a hotel, which I found amazing. I would never do that now. Not that I have any adversity to people or whatever, but he doesn't know anybody. He, you know, I had three brothers and sisters. We were in a house with six people already. So that to me kind of said what, client kind of told me what kind of person he was, but I had been studying privately. Um, you know, I, I started drums in the fifth grade in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and never looked, never looked back. I, I always knew that that's what I wanted to do. And um, through junior high, it was reinforced. Through high school, it was reinforced. And um, when I decided to, to go to college, I had um, applied to both North Texas State and the University of Miami. But when Louie um, stayed at the house and we became quite close and he really thought that I could do, you know, well in college, he said, you know, I live in Northridge. Maybe you could come out to Cal State Northridge. They have a great jazz band there and you can study with me and blah, 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 blah. And so I did a complete about face and in my senior year, switch gears and um, applied to Cal State Northridge and majored in percussion performance with a minor in composition there. Tell me, when did you get your first drum kit? I got my first drum kit uh, probably in, um, I would say, the seventh grade. But I had a snare drum. I got my first snare drum uh, in, in the fifth grade in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, you know, when I started out playing in the concert band there. David, I want to do a little bit of drum talk with you here. Okay. What's your approach to the drum kit? Well, I think, you know, I started out uh, in the traditional sense with, you know, learning the rudiments and, um, you know, um, sight reading and all that kind of stuff, more in a concert band traditional sense, but in the jazz sense, because I started off so young with, such an amazing jazz program and uh, were exposed to a lot of great artists and stuff. And the focus of my drumming was uh, jazz oriented. David, let's talk endorsements. What endorsements are you doing on the drum kit and cymbals and sticks and so forth? Well, I've gone through uh, a, a lot of them. I, I, I started with Remo, went to Yamaha. I'm currently now with Tamburo. And tamburo drums are, are relatively unknown here in America. They've been around for 40 years. They're handmade in Italy. They're very, very well respected uh, in Europe. And those that use it here find them incredible because it's, it, it's all handmade, like the violins and stuff. It's just, it, it's just an art form. So they're starting to, to um, you know, they have a, a, a North American division. So they're starting to, um, expand in this country. And so not only do I endorse their drums, but they have now come out with a Dave Black um, student signature snare drum series that is packaged with a Dave Black signature snare drum, Alfred's Drum Method Book One, which is the beginning book that it, a lot of people use, um, you know, a drum stand and a, a backpack uh, for kids to, to carry the um, the sticks uh, and the drum and a Vic Firth pair of Dave Black signature um, snare drum sticks. And so drum heads, I endorse Remo and um, uh, cymbals are uh, with Sabian. Fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about your credits. What was it like working with Alan King? It was a lot of fun. He, he, he was a great guy. He was just, um, you know, very down to earth, very funny. Um, he was great to hang out. It wasn't, um, you know, uh, the kind of person that uh, was, you know, kind of, you know, do the job and leave me alone kind of thing. He, he was very um, easy to work with. And it wasn't a lot really, um, you know, for the drummer or the band to do. In his case, it's play on and off and, you know, he's doing his thing uh you know on stage and there's not really a lot of musical elements that go along with what he's doing on stage 
Let's talk about your awards. And there's quite a few of them here. I tell you, I've got one piece of paper. I should have uh, had four or five talking to you here. You're, you're too kind. <laughs> uh, one of the many awards, which I want to talk about a few of them here, was just what you're speaking of, Certified Gold Award, 500,000 copies. Yeah. Was that of the book? Yeah, that's Alfred's Drum Method, book one. Wow. When that uh, award was given, um, it was at 500,000. It's now over 700,000. So I'm hoping to get platinum sometime before I die. Um, but uh, just incredibly lucky, that book or whatever. It was just the right timing at the right time. And a company who was very, very much behind it. And it has become... The, the biggest selling, you know, drum book that there is now, you know, we know stick control has sold a lot and, and, and the syncopation book, which Alfred also owns. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's over the years and stuff, but yeah, at its peak Alfred's uh, drum methods were selling over 30,000 copies a year. Um, and to date, like I said, it's over 700,000. So it's, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And the drum set method has now sold a quarter of a million. So we, we, we got very, very lucky. And it was, it was the marketing push behind it that was, made it so successful or helped make it more su successful. I'm so tempted to ask you, what was Alfred like? Alfred was amazing. You know, Alfred at the time when I started in 1985 was I think the third or fourth um, largest um, educational music publisher in, in the United States. And I think when I started, there was only 10 drum publications. Uh, and Sandy Feldstein, who was the uh, executive vice president at the time was also a drummer. His degree was in percussion. He taught percussion at um, um, Sunny um, University in New York, and then became a, a, a writer and a, a business executive. And, and so um, I had, um, like I said, already had a jazz band publication with them. So he knew who I was and, and knew me. And, you know, I had been on the road for so many years and I was looking to get off the road because I just didn't want to do that life you know, for forever. And I you know, heard that there was a, a, an opening coming up uh, in, at Alfred. And um, I applied for the job, which was in marketing at that time, and got the job. And it's funny because um, three months after I started working at Alfred, or maybe it was two months, Sandy came to me and he said, you know, we, we have a brush book that Louie kind of started, but it's kind of stalled because nobody really knows what to do with it or, you know, how to make it work and stuff. You, you, you want to take a look at it and see what, what you can do. So I did. And um, the exercises were there, but the concept of how to do the swishes and stuff were not and how to organize the book. So in talking with my college professor, Joel Leach, you know, we, we came up with the concept of the hands of a clock, you know, to sw swish this way and counterclockwise and stuff. And so with that um, diagram and stuff, we were able to make the book work. And then I added a whole nother Latin section and special effects and stuff like that. And so that ended up becoming my first book co-authored with Louie and Hank Belson, and that was in 1985. David, we do a thing on the show we call Word of Advice. Well, I ask the drummers, I ask the guests if they will leave a part in Word of Advice for the up-and-comer drummers, even the guy at the next levels, but that are trying to get traction in this game, in this industry. Would you leave them a word of advice, please? Sure, I have. Two, two pieces of advice that I, that I always share. One is do what is in your heart and, and what you love, not what you think is going to pay the most. Because if you do that and you love what you do, you'll find a way to make a living or the money at it. Don't do something just because you think you're going to make 
more money at it. And the other thing, and it's, it's especially true uh, uh, now, much more so than when I was growing up, is, you know, pursue what you love, but have a plan B in place. Because music now, the music business, um, you know, whether it's composing, playing live, touring, it's very, very hard to make a living. So have a plan B in place. You know, if you want to do it for the love of it and for, you know, some money or whatever, do that for the love of it and have a backup plan so that you can eat and, and live. But, um, yeah, have a plan B. Pursue what you want, but have a plan B. There is a question I always ask in closing. David, what would you want your legacy to be, to be said, to be told? Oh, wow, that's a heavy question. Um, I think, I think my my greatest legacy would be just the hundreds of thousands of students who have gone through my books. Whether those people um, decided to continue into drumming, whether they decided to go into music, the fact that they were hopefully able to gain some kind of enjoyment through learning music and or drums makes me really happy because I know that um, music is a great um, motivator. It's a great uh, community activity. It's a great way to build on um, lots of skills other than just music. I mean, you know, uh, working with other people, um, discipline, um, patience, all that kind of stuff. So I hope that my legacy is, is really that, um, you know, the, the, the people that I was able to start uh, their journey on by, you know, using those beginning drum books and, and, and what that they got something out of it that they, whether they continued or not. So, and, and I, I will add one more thing. I think Louie taught me so much about the kind of person to be in life and stuff. And I think what I learned so much from, from him and what I try and do is I try and give back as much as I get. So if I see somebody that, that's struggling or needs something, I am more than glad to buy that for them. I'm more than glad to sit down and work with them for free. Uh, I, while I, at Alfred, I was more than happy to give away free books to those who couldn't afford it. Um, you know, th those kinds of things uh, really come uh, back around in, in, in a good way. And, and that's kind of, you know, you want to treat people the way you want to be treated. And Louis lived his life like that. And everybody loved and respected him as a result of that. And um, I really try and live my life like that. If I'm in an opportunity to help somebody, to make a phone call, to make a recommendation, to sit down and read through something that they're working on, whether it's music or not, and make suggestions, I'll do that gratis because I think it's important to, to give back in that way. Oh, yeah, I should have had four or five pages of this, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, David, let me say thank you so very much for coming on to the Extraordinary Drummer Show. Thank you so much for having me. It, it was an honor uh, to be here with you. I thank you for reaching out. Um, I, I'm glad to be able to contribute anything that I can. And I will say to you, if, you know, th this, um, you know, starts playing and people start responding and have, questions or uh, anything, please feel free to direct them my way whenever I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that somebody may have or just listen to them or give them any kind of advice and stuff. I love doing that kind of stuff. So uh, bring it on. That's very nice of you. Will you help us wave goodbye to all the fans? Hey, thank you, everybody. Good luck with whatever you decide to pursue and um, stay healthy and happy. Thank you, David. Thank you.